Hey everyone, welcome to God's Plan, Your Part, Year 2, where this year we're reading through and studying the entire New Testament, one chapter at a time. Thanks again for joining us in discovering God's plan and your part in it. When Jesus changes your heart, it will change your life. And if your life has not changed, it's very possible that Jesus has not changed changed your heart. (laughs) If you've been around church for a long time, you're probably aware of this like faith and works conversation. Uh, Recently, I was teaching on this faith and works conversation. I don't love how I did it. And reading over Luke chapter eight, I feel like I've gotten a little bit more clarity on this because I think that Jesus is talking to some extent about this. And I'm excited to dive into Luke chapter eight here today. There's a lot of stories here. There's a lot more here than what I'm saying, but I'm excited to get into it. So what resonated with me the most that I think goes with what you're saying is verses 16 to 18, talking about your um, lamp not being hidden under a jar or hidden under a bed. And I think what essentially it's saying that refers back to what you were talking about is we have all of these examples. There's like seven or eight stories of what Jesus is doing these like miraculous things that Jesus is healing people of. He's calming storms. He's getting people like free of demons. And all of these things were done plainly in front of these people. They see it. And it's like, we serve this amazing God who frees us from eternal judgment. Why would we take something like what we believe in, what we know about God and try to hide it or keep it to ourselves when the eternal destination or final judgment for people who are far from God or don't know God Mm is to not be with him and glorify him forever. So I think this idea of the lamp under the jar is probably what is sticking out to me the most. It's funny. I think Jenny and I are having very different experiences as we read over these stories. Like I'm reading over these stories that we've read like a hundred million times. I'm like, oh man, I want to read it again and see if I like see something new or experience it differently. (laughs) I think, uh, Jenny, I think when you're reading over these stories, you're kind of like, seriously, we're talking about seeds again. I think the seeds are way overplayed. I think they're getting a little worn out, but it, that's just me. And I tried not to bring that opinion up, but you did it. So there it is. <laughs> On that note, let's talk about the seeds. <laughs> uh-huh. um, it is. It's a story we've heard a lot. It's a story that shows up in a lot of the Gospels. So if you've been wa- listening to the podcast. And um, it is important. I don't want that to seem like something I don't appreciate. It's just. We've covered it many out. times. Yeah. So one of the things I'm noticing in this story is that All of these seeds are thrown out. The word has been thrown out in every situation, but only one of them is lasting and produces fruit, which is not a new, wonderful insight. But what's like what's getting my attention is this is meant to teach us something. And so it should teach us that like we can all hear the word of God. But if we're going to have the word of God, like produce a harvest in our lives, we have to do what verse 15 says. Um, If we're good soil will be those who hear the word, hold fast to it in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. It's not immediate. The word patience actually implies that it takes a very long time, and we have to continually make decisions according to the word that's been revealed to us. And I think you're talking about the lamp under the jar. He moves right into that story. When we are hearing the word and making decisions according to that word, we will automatically be a lamp not hidden under a jar. We'll be giving light to the people around us. That's that whole idea of When Jesus changes our hearts, it changes our lives. We now bear fruit. We now keep with repentance. We now show good works to the world. I think it also goes with what we were talking about yesterday about, um, help me with the quote again. It's like, um, be honest and truthful about what the word says, but stay soft or how did, what was the stay? Well, I was just saying we we can tell the truth, but we need to stay soft. We don't don't compromise. That being said, I think this kind of goes hand in hand with that too, because this talking about the seeds, like everybody has the opportunity to hear the word of God. Like all of these seeds being thrown out is like representative of that. Um, And the one that produces and falls on that good seed or excuse me, on that good soil and is the one that is producing fruit and growing, that should also be, I think, like a representation of what the lamp is. Yes. Um, To like, to grow and be the example to, although others are hearing it and might not be receiving it the same way, um, still remain truthful and like represent what God has for us, requires of us in a world that rejects it and stay soft to those who are, still rejecting it themselves. And hopefully you can think of people that you know, maybe the people you know personally, maybe people you know about, who made a big deal about learning God's word and keeping with God's word. And they 
bore a lot of fruit and they kept with repentance and there's a huge harvest because of their faithfulness. Like hopefully you have people like that. If you can't think of somebody, you might be that person. Like you might get to be the first person in your generation to be able to do that. And we encourage you to stick to it, be patient and bear fruit. Um, but kind of this, this thing that I've been thinking about and wrestling with is that we're not saved by the good things that we do, but if we're not doing good things, we're probably not saved. And I know that can be like a scandalous opinion in certain circles. Um, but one of the things I was hearing this guy talk about today is one of the ways that we um, commune in God's kingdom. One of the way we enjoy relationship with God in God's kingdom is we live according to what he has revealed to us. So when we have been made into new creations by the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, we've been regenerated into new people, we do things that bring honor and glory to Christ, and that's how we enjoy relationship with each other, and it's how we enjoy relationship with God. So if we are trying to uh, enter into some kind of faith that doesn't require that we change and we like don't willingly change, we're missing out on a huge part of the life that God has designed for us and laid out for us. And one of the things he's designed for us and laid out for us is that we would be a light for all to see, not a lamp hidden under a jar. That's why I like these two stories. And that's why I think these two stories are back to back and put together. I think your works conversation is really helpful there too, because I, I think it is easy to get hung up on works versus um, faith and that whole conversation. But if you think about it, like if you have faith, your life should re- be reflected in the works that you do. Like it should be no mystery to someone that you are a Christian when you tell them that. Um, it should be evident in the decisions that you make and the practices that you keep. Um, and it should be obvious like this lamp that is hopefully shining for the world to see. And what's really interesting to me is I think it's it's really hard and I think it's something that you have to grow in for sure because I certainly have and I'm still growing um, is this idea of like being super upfront with someone about my yeah. faith yeah. and like shoving it in their, th- like in their minds or whatever, <laughs> shoving it in their face. But then there's also a piece of, I've heard a lot of stories of people who have known individuals that are extremely far from God, living lives of very not God honoring choices that saw the lives of people that did reflect these things and that were that light that was not hidden under a a jar or a table and were seriously impacted by the decisions and the lifestyles that these Christians had. And it caused them to question, Mm -hmm. why do you live like this? Like it, because of those works mixed with that faith, it invited them in, in a way that didn't seem like it was Mm -hmm. just being shoved down their throat um, or in a way that was not, authentic. It's a fantastic real world example of being an actual light. And if you're not an actual light, like how could you possibly shine? How could anybody notice? Mm -hmm. Um, So speaking of real life change, we move into a story of real life change. We have this demoniac man, this guy that is possessed by many demons uh, across the lake on the other side of the Sea of Galilee. Um, and the, the demons recognize Jesus. The demons know Jesus. This man has been overwhelmed and overcome by demons on a regular basis to the point that they like throw him down. Uh, he has superhuman strength. He busts out of shackles often. He lives in tombs. Uh, this man is essentially a dead man. Like There's nothing about this man that is this man. These demons have overwhelmed and overcome his entire life. And Jesus just overwhelms this evil power very quickly. Uh, I think part of this story that kind of threw me off a little bit, and I don't know how much you want to dig into it, but uh, verse 31, when the demons are about to be cast out, they beg him not to uh, command them into the abyss, but rather Jesus commands them into a herd of pigs. But it's interesting to me, the abyss is where Satan and his angels reside, and they are uninterested and begging Jesus, please don't send us there. So it's interesting to me that something that is already so evil still rejects and despises what is ultimately evil. Like, wow, that's crazy. It is an interesting observation. I don't know a lot about that kind of thing. I think just on the surface, it Very seems, face value. It seems like there's two options here. One, like they, the demons, Satan, will ultimately be judged and overcome and cast down. 
So there is a future in all of our lives where there is no evil because evil has been destroyed by the power of God. It's possible these demons see Jesus and they think that time has arrived, that mm-hmm. they, they see the power of God present in Jesus. Mm-hmm. And they're like, oh, my word, like, please don't destroy us and overcome us in this moment. And actually what you see here is Jesus gives grace to this man. Jesus apparently gives grace to these demons and cast them into pigs. And these pigs run into the sea. There's like 2000 of them. We know this is not a Jewish land because Jewish people would not be raising pigs. Um, It's it's just a powerful story. It's another one of the stories you probably heard a lot of times, but if you think about um, people changing or Jesus changing hearts and then like that person's life looking different, this man is incredibly different. He becomes essentially an evangelist. Like he goes, he wants to be a disciple because he asked Jesus to get in the boat. But then Jesus says, return to your home. This is verse 39. Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Like that's this is huge. Like he becomes an evangelist. He preaches and teaches the people, um, tells them about who Jesus is. And I mean, we can assume people came to Jesus because of his changed life. And it's easy to kind of forget that part, too, because I always just, I don't know, instantly focus on the pigs and what's going on with that situation, how crazy and demonic this yeah. power must be. But then it's so easy to to quickly brush over that last part that he went on to proclaim Christ and what he's done. Like, that's pretty significant. And how often do we hear cool stories of what God has done in people's testimonies? And it's so exciting and it's so encouraging And that's the part that I missed out on the most in this story. We do know that this was in the region of the Decapolis. And we also know that um, when the when Jerusalem was overrun by the Romans and there was like this incredibly huge persecution, a lot of believing Christians um, fled to the Decapolis for safety. And we can I mean, we may be able to assume that there were Christians there because of this man. And so there was a Christian community in this Decapolis area where they were able to find safety during the persecution. It's really interesting. So I, we could probably tap into a little bit of this last story just very briefly. It's, again, Jesus showing his power and this miracle of this woman who had been bleeding for years upon years upon years. And the cool thing, again, Jesus says to her as soon as he realizes that his power is left, she basically is like, it was me. I'm so sorry. And he says to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. There's that faith piece that goes along with the actual act of making her better Mm -hmm. again. So again, her life would be another testimony of what God has done for her physically and spiritually, which is just another really awesome story. Again, she's a completely different person. Mm -hmm. She's able to interact with people she was never able to interact with because she would have been unclean. And then again, on top of that story, we have this story of this little girl who was actually dead. And Jesus touched her hand and raised her from the dead. This is the second person that Jesus has raised from the dead um, in two chapters. He raised this widow's son from the dead in Luke 7. And I'm going to say that like these two resurrections are both stories that probably don't make your list of like Jesus' most popular miracles. You may think that Lazarus is the only person that Jesus raised from the dead. That's not true. Um, There's two people in two chapters. So the your part for today would be to think about your own life. We all have a unique story of how God has either come into our life or maybe you're at the point where you know that God is intervening and revealing himself to you. Maybe you have questions because of things that you've seen in other people's lives. So I would encourage you to think about those times, reflect on um, what God has done in your own life. And I would encourage you even more so that when you recognize those things, that you are encouraged to shine your light to the people around you, um, the people that you rub shoulders with every day in hopes that that will continually spread to others. Just remember, it's not to glorify yourself. It's to glorify nope. God. Like, right. like God has done incredible things in our lives. We want to represent God by the way we live our lives and tell our stories. It's always a powerful thing to tell the story of what God has done in your life. And for our audience, that could be you. You could know exactly what we're talking about because you've experienced um, God's work in your life. It could be that you have not experienced God's work in your life because you need to repent and allow Jesus to be the authority, the sole authority in your life. You need to obey his commandments. You need to find salvation through him. And then you will have a story of how Jesus has radically changed 
your life. So we want to encourage you. We want to pray for you. If there's any way we can be praying for you, uh, please email us at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. Uh, we'll be sure to pray for you. We'll be back again tomorrow with Luke chapter 9. We'll see you then. Thanks for joining today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. As always, please consider partnering with us as we are a listener-supported podcast that we hope to continue to grow with support from listeners just like you. We've made it super easy to partner with us, and you can support us by following the link in our show notes or our description. You can support us with as little as $3 a month. Every little bit of this helps so much, and we're so thankful for your support. With that in mind, here's today's reading. Luke chapter 8. Soon afterward, he went on through cities and the villages, proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him, and also some women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities. Mary called Magdalene, from whom seven demons had gone out, and Joanna, the wife of Chusa, Herod's household manager, and Susanna, and many others who provided for them out of their means. And when a great crowd was gathering, and people from town after town came to him, he said in a parable, A sower went out to sow his seed, and as he sowed, some fell along the path and was trampled underfoot, and the birds of the air devoured it. And some fell on the rock, and as it grew up, it withered away because it had no moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up with it and choked it. And some fell into good soil and grew and yielded a hundredfold. As he said these things, he called out, He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And when his disciples asked him what this parable meant, he said, To you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of God. But for others they are in parables, so that seeing they may not see, and hearing they may not understand. Now the parable is this, The seed is the word of God. The ones along the path are those who have heard. Then the devil comes and takes away the word from their hearts so that they may not believe and be saved. And the ones on the rock are those who, when they hear the word, receive it with joy. But these have no root. They believe for a while, and in a time of testing they fall away. And as for what fell among the thorns, they are those who hear, but as they go on their way they are choked out by the cares and the riches and the pleasures of life, and their fruit does not mature. As for that in the good soil, they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart, and bear fruit with patience." No one, after lighting a lamp, covers it with a jar or puts it under a bed, but puts it on a stand, so that those who enter may see the light. For nothing is hidden that will not be made manifest, nor is anything secret that will not be known and come to light. Take care, then, how you hear, for the one who has more will be given, and from the one who has not, even what he thinks that he has will be taken away. Then his mother and his brothers came to him, but they could not reach him because of the crowd. And he was told, Your mother and your brothers are standing outside, desiring to see you. But he answered them, My mother and my brothers are those who hear the word of God and do it. One day he got into a boat with his disciples, and he said to them, Let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were filling with water, and they were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, Where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, Who then is this that he commands even the winds and the water, and they obey him? Then they sailed to the country of the Gerasenes, which is opposite Galilee. When Jesus had stepped out on the land, there met him a man from the city who had demons. For a long time he had worn no clothes, and he had not lived in a house but among the tombs. When he saw Jesus, he cried out and fell down before him and said with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, the Son of the Most High God? I beg you, do not torment me. For he had commanded the unclean spirit to come out of the man, for many a time it had seized him. He was kept under guard and bound with chains and shackles, but he would break the bonds and be driven by the demon into the desert. Jesus then asked him, What is your name? And he said, Legion, for many demons had entered him. And they begged him not to command them to depart into the abyss. Now a large herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him to let them enter these. So he gave them permission. Then the demons came out of the man and entered the pigs, and the herd rushed down the steep bank into the lake and drowned. 
When the herdsmen saw what had happened, they fled and told it in the city and in the country. Then people went out to see what had happened, and they came to Jesus and found the man from whom the demons had gone, sitting at the feet of Jesus, clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. And those who had seen it told them how the demon-possessed man had been healed. Then all the people of the surrounding country of the Gerasenes asked him to depart from them, for they were seized with great fear. So he got into the boat and returned. The man from whom the demons had gone begged that he might be with him. But Jesus sent him away, saying, Return to your home and declare how much God has done for you. And he went away, proclaiming throughout the whole city how much Jesus had done for him. Now when Jesus returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. And there came a man named Jairus, who was a ruler of the synagogue. And falling at Jesus' feet, he implored him to come to his house. For he had an only daughter, about twelve years of age, and she was dying. And Jesus went, the people pressed around him. And there was a woman who had a discharge of blood for twelve years, and though she had spent all her living on physicians, she could not be healed by anyone. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his garment, and immediately her discharge of blood ceased. And Jesus said, Who was it that touched me? When all denied it, Peter said, Master, the crowds surround you and are pressing in on you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me, for I perceived that power has gone out from me. And when the woman saw that she was not hidden, she came trembling and falling down before him, and declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him, and how she had been immediately healed. And he said to her, Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. While he was still speaking, Someone from the ruler's house came and said, Your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any more. But Jesus, on hearing this, answered him, Do not fear. Only believe, and she will be well. And when he came to the house, he allowed no one to enter with him except Peter and John and James, and the father and mother of the child. And all were weeping and mourning for her. But he said, Do not weep, for she is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But taking her by the hand, he called, saying, Child, arise. And her spirit returned, and she got up at once. And he directed that something should be given to her to eat. And her parents were amazed, but he charged them to tell no one what had happened. Thank you so much for listening to today's episode of God's Plan, Your Part. Don't forget, you can find us on just about every social media platform and YouTube. Let us know what you thought of today's episode, and if you have any questions, go ahead and post them there. You can also reach out to us directly at godsplanyourpart at gmail.com. As always, if you don't have a Bible, or if you'd like to use the one that we use, uh, reach out to us via email, and we'll be happy to send one to you. Thanks again for listening. We'll see you again tomorrow.